Hey there, this is Rapid Prototyping with Unity Events, writing reusable and scalable by default code without endless planning. Uh, I'm Will Patillo, and this is a presentation recorded for the Unity PDX Meetup. The uh, overview of this talk is going over what are Unity Events, uh, mention some of their example uses, describe some benefits of using this technique. Uh, I'll have it talk about a workflow I use for uh, creating rapid prototyping in a Unity event-driven way, and compare Unity events to other techniques for getting scripts to communicate with each other, uh, discuss how to overcome some of the apparent limitations of Unity events that can put people off from using them at first, and then also mention some real limitations and when it's better to use something else. Uh, my background in this is I have been programming for uh, roughly five years, maybe a little longer. I've been uh, working as a professional freelancer for about three years. My largest project was Rogue Invader, which is out now on uh, both Steam and the Epic Game Store. I have also recently started my own uh, game studio. I'm currently in active development on a game called Oscillarium uh, with multiple other projects planned in the future. And uh, some things I've found uh, is first, when working on freelance kind of stuff, almost every project I've worked on, there were previous developers before me who had ran into a wall created by uh, technical debt where they just couldn't make any progress beyond that. And one of my first tasks was always to uh, basically rescue the project uh, from those issues and uh, resolve things, simplify things down so that it could continue to move forward to completion. And in my own uh, projects, I've seen a constant tension between the need to uh, have a limited budget versus the need to constantly iterate on things and, and uh, change stuff and, uh, and, and test things. I find that being able to have a process for rapid prototyping uh, is a great way to help balance those competing interests. So the, the summary of this background here is, is things like uh, scalability and reusability. Those aren't just things that engineers obsess over. They, like, they, they actually matter in a very uh, practical sort of way. So uh, first, what are Unity events? You've actually probably seen them already. If you uh, use any of their built-in buttons, there'll be a button component. And towards the bottom of it, there's this little section that says on click, where you can uh, drag in an object and uh, call a public method in some other script by looking at this dropdown, finding all the components on the object you brought in. And then once you found the component, there's another nested dropdown that uh, lists all the methods there that you can then call and uh, send something. So in this case, uh, there's a little dialogue controller and I've just selected option zero. And so how do you create your own Unity events? Uh, well, here's a one of the simplest examples that is also something that I uh, use in a, a practical level all the time uh, called a validate event. So how it works is I just attach this component to anything and I click this little trigger box and it prints hello world to the console uh, as, as an example. And uh, the way this works, well, going backwards, this uh, print to console is just a little script that has a public void print, takes in a string, prints it out. And I validate event, I have this serialized trigger, which is just this little checkbox. Um, on validate is a built-in Unity method. If you haven't used it, it's extremely useful for debugging, uh, where it is called every time you change something in the editor, such as ticking this, this trigger tick box. And so whenever I tick this, this method will be, get called, calls on trigger. And if trigger is true, it gets set back to false and invokes this Unity event response, uh, which is this right here. And uh, this validate event is extremely useful like whenever I just want to test something. So let's say you have an exploding barrel and you've built the explosion, but you haven't built the hit point system yet uh, to that actually would trigger the explosion. But you just want to see if the explosion works before working on anything else. Uh, so you could just uh, attach this to that and tick that, see if the explosion works, and if it does, uh, be able to move on. Common script, I, I've been using this one in almost every project I've worked on for years now. It may become obsolete with Unity's new uh, input system, although that, that's been a little bit uh, complicated, so I've resisted uh, really picking it up. Uh, but how this works is I just specify uh, a number of bindings 
for each binding, say what keys are associated with it, whether it's a press down, press up, or continuous, and then what happens as a result. Uh, another favorite is respond to custom tag. And so this is whenever you want to detect a trigger collision or a regular collision between two specific types of objects. So right here, this, this would be likely a, a player um, child object. This is with the, the model on it, and it's got a collider. And then also has this custom tags component uh, with the player scriptable object here. And this, this scriptable object is, is an empty thing. It's um, just a little asset that I can drag in there. No, not necessarily any data in it, although there could be. And then this, uh, this character walks into a trigger area and I have this respond to custom tags on it. And what this does is it's when there is a trigger, uh, enter, so I, it could either be enter, exit, or, or continuous based on this dropdown value. It checks if this custom tags component is attached. And if so, if it has uh, any of the tags listed here. So this is looking for the player tags, so it will respond to this one. But if this had a different tag like enemy, then this would not respond. As a more complex example, this is a setup for arc teleport in virtual reality. Uh, so uh, we can see all the components broken up here. Uh, this is a uh, this gets trackpad input um, on on, an, on a, any XR controller, and this just sends it out as a vector two over here, and. If you're not familiar with how uh, teleportation works in VR, typically it's you move up on a trackpad or joystick and like most of the way forward. And then when you release it, that's so pushing forward uh, shows the arc in a, in a teleport. And then once you release, then that's when the teleport actually happens. This binary threshold detects when you've gone from not touching the trackpad to above 0.6 on the y-axis, and then uh, responds again when it goes below 0.3, uh, and it have a little bit of separation between those thresholds to, pre to prevent flickering. And this activates and deactivates the parabolic arc, as well as actually te potentially teleporting the rig um, when you exit out. This calculate a parabolic arc, just gets a series of points in a parabola, uh, and passes that along to finding hits in the path, uh, so anything that might be an obstacle, which then passes those along to creating a cutoff version of the path, uh, which looks at the path and also any obstacles, uh, finds the first obstacles that would actually block uh, block the teleport arc and creates a new arc that's, that's cut off there. Uh, there's a split trinary for some success fail states uh, visibility. And then finally, we actually teleport the rig. And if it's successful, then we play a sound. Uh, but rather than a specific sound, it could be one of many sounds. And this uh, figures out which of those to use. And the nice thing about having it broken up this way, because this could have all just been one really big script, is that each of these can be used separately and they'll, they all work independently of each other. So I could get uh, my. XR track trackpad input uh, to control a little RC car in, in VR if I wanted, or I could use this parabolic arc to for like a two-dimensional tanks game where you just take turns like shooting things back and forth. Um, and multi-sound could be used for all kinds of things that want to play uh, varied sounds. Uh, so it's it's not all I don't have to repeat a lot of the work that's done for each of these. And also I'm able to test them in isolation to make sure each part works. If there's a problem, isolate where the problem is. And then once I found all those edge cases, when I when I reuse it, it's not just that I've built it, it's, all, it's also been thoroughly tested. The uh, benefits of Unity events, for, and some of these may have been implied just by looking at the examples, but to call them out specifically, uh, first, the ability to call public methods without knowing the class that those methods are in uh, decreases a lot of the need for more complex programming techniques like um, inheritance and interfaces and so on. So uh, one thing that you may have uh, seen if you've done some programming is that when you went one script to talk to another, you generally need, you need to know what that script is, at least in C Sharp. And uh, so that might involve a get component or something else. Uh, but the thing is, well, what if you don't know what type it's going to be? What if that changes? What if it could be lots of different things? 
And so the way that's typically dealt with, uh, if you didn't have Unity events, would be to uh, bring together all, uh, is to figure out all of the things that it might communicate with, find what all of those have in common, and then work through that set of commonalities. And that's effectively what an interface is, kind of same for an abstract class uh, in, you know, in a nutshell. Um, and the and that's that's fine. It's not that much code to to set that up. Uh, the challenge is that takes a lot of advanced planning. You need to know uh, what the commonalities are, and if you bring in too much or too little, then you have to go back and change it. And that's why it's often necessary to get out a whiteboard and have all these complicated class diagrams on it, uh, so that you can really make sure you plan things out correctly in advance, and it doesn't cause you a bunch of headaches later. Um, but with Unity events because it doesn't matter, you don't need to deal with any of that. You can just say, what is the script sending out? What this other script needs to, to operate? Connect them together and you're done and you don't really need to plan anything. Uh, the second benefit of Unity events is that because you're connecting one instance to another uh, in, in the scene, rather than uh, specifying any types in code, uh, you eliminate the need to create any dependencies in the code. So things can be a lot more modular uh, just automatically. And then lastly, uh, related to that, uh, because all the connections are exposed in the editor, this allows designers to actually control functionality. Um, so as, as an example, there, there were a number of times when I was uh, working on Rogue Invader and I, you know, I built a bunch of systems and then later I was kind of playing through it and I saw things that happened that like, where did that come from? Like, I never built that. And well, it's because the designer was actually put together some of connected together some of my components in a creative way uh, that hadn't even occurred to me uh, to create functionality without having to ask me for it. And this is fantastic, especially for freelancing, uh, because as an engineer, I'm constantly looking for ways to decrease my workload, partially to protect my own sanity, but also to uh, decrease the amount of hours that I have to build with the client uh, so that the project can, can uh, stay in on budget. And uh, in contrast, designers tend to love having as many controls as they can possibly have, because uh, that allows them to really iterate on, the, on ideas, uh, try things out without having a big wait time as, as they you know, send me a task. I uh, have to fix, finish the one that I'm on before I get to it and so on. Uh, and so it just allows for more iteration uh, more exploration and just a better quality game. So to make the biggest use of these advantages, uh, I like to use a process that's centered around Unity events. Um, but there's a couple of rules I need to follow in order to make them like really useful and something I can I can build uh, a practice around uh, as opposed to just a trick I use once in a while. And the most important thing for this to work is to make sure that every that each script that's being written in this way uh, defines a single process at a single level of abstraction. And by the way, if you've ever heard the term single responsibility principle, this is effectively my this is my definition of it: a, a single process at a single level of abstraction. And it's especially that second part of it I think gets overlooked a lot. So, for example, if you have a uh, class called game manager. And you could argue that, oh, it has a single responsibility. It manages the state of the game. Oh, what about only a single reason to change? Well, the game specification changes. That's that's one reason. Well, no, <laughs> that doesn't work because, well, sure, it's fine if game manager manages things like uh, transitions between playing and paused and, and main menu or something like that. But then if it also defines what happens when the game is, is, is playing, and then subsystems within that, and what happens when the game's paused and how that works. Well, you're then you're describing what happens and also what that means and then what those things means. And so that's multiple levels of abstraction. Uh, so ideally, and I'm not going to follow this all the time. There are, there are cases when it's, you know, you don't want to be pure. Um, but in, in the ideal, each script just stays at a top level of these are the things that happen in this process. And uh, a way I like to go about that um, is to take a, a bottom-up approach where I start with the most like basic uh, functionality and, uh, and then you can use those to create building blocks, which I can then string together to create more complex functionality. And then those become building blocks for even more complex things. 
Anyway, though, so when we have that single process defined, then the process has a set of inputs and a set of outputs. Input are generally public methods, but I would also include a Unity uh, engine called methods like start and update. And then the outputs go out through Unity events, and then optionally you could have uh, variables for settings and internal state. So here's an example uh, following that idea. So uh, right here, I have a script called face target, and its function is pretty clearly defined as being uh, calculating a turn axis to necessary to face a target. So this is something you might use for a turret or um, a AI character controller that, you know, that kind of exists on a plane. The inputs, well, it's triggered by every frame, so the, the frame transitions. Uh, also, setting and clearing the target is, is another form of input. The output is the vector three for the turn axis. So this is either going to be vector three dot up to turn clockwise, uh, down to turn counterclockwise, or zero to not turn. And settings are a range of angles, so uh, a minimum angle, so it doesn't you know, flicker when it's when it's reaching it, and then a, a maximum angle, so like you can sneak behind it without it turning. Um, and the state is its current target right now. Okay, so now that I've uh, said a lot of good things about Unity events, uh, now it's time to go over some challenges uh, working with them. And I think here it's going to be easiest if I just uh, demonstrate some of them in a project. So the first is uh, sending dynamic arguments. So uh, right here I have a validate event that is connected to this uh, response. It's going into this input counter method. It's taking an integer, printing it out. Uh, very simple, just kind of a little toy example here. And if I click this, and then I get, you know, I get the, the number that I have in here. So if I put in a five, it prints that out, 12 prints that out. Okay, well, that's that's fine. But suppose I want to use this as an actual counter where it goes up each time I click on it. Well, there's no number I can just type here in editor uh, so that it's always increasing. And because um, it needs to be a calculated value. So to deal with that, I'll have this thing called this uh, counter script. And this is going to uh, increment. So it's going to store a count, increase that each time it's activated, and then send that out through this thing called an int event. And uh, I'll explain what, what that is in a moment. But uh, so I'll just rewire this here, go to the counter, click the increment, and then the counter then calls that input counter. So as I click this trigger button, uh, we can see that this goes from one to two, to three, to four, to five, and so on. Okay, so but what is this, this int event that I just mentioned? This, this is not something built into Unity. Well, this is actually from another script that I've uh, written, and there's a bunch here, but the only thing you really need to pay attention to is just this line. Once I have this line, uh, anywhere in the project, then I can use int event and be able to send dynamic integers uh, through Unity events. And I can just do that for all the other types that I can think of, one for float, vector2, vector3, boolean. Uh, I can send lists and arrays this way. Uh, I can send multiple uh, arguments, like a, by just putting a comma in these triangle brackets and, and giving it an appropriate name. I can send uh, custom structs and classes, any kind of data you want. Uh, you just create a line for it. If it's a generic thing that could be used in any project, then I just put it in a common file, move it between projects. If it's something, it's a data type that's specific to a project, then I'll, I'll make sure it's not in this so it doesn't create errors when I move it around. Okay, so that is uh, dynamic arguments. Uh, next challenge is when you want to send certain types of static arguments. So. As an example, let's take a look at my uh, response class again. And I have this thing called an input direction. And this is taking in a vector three, debug logs out the value. Okay, that, that should seem pretty simple. It's just like this input counter, right? So I go to this validate event and I look at this example response. Uh, I look through here, I see the input counter, but I don't see input direction anywhere on there. Where, where is it? Well, uh, this is just a challenge, and I, I really wish Unity would, would improve on this. Um, but only certain types of data can be sent in through Unity events. It's kind of think it's based off of what is, uh, is serialized. And integers can be sent, vector threes cannot. 
Um, so I guess, what does that mean? You just can't send that kind of stuff? You, you have to use some other way? Well, there's actually a, a workaround. It's a bit of a hack, but uh, it works. Because one of the things that you can send through Unity events are scriptable objects. Uh, so that's what I have right here, this input direction. And I'm sending this thing I'm calling a vector3 SO for scriptable object. And then this just pulls the value out of that. So well, what is this? This is a scriptable object that contains a vector3. The scriptable objects contain anything. Uh, you can put all kinds of data you want. You can put methods in these things. So you just send in a scriptable object, pull the value from it, and then it works the same as before. So let's uh, connect that up. Go to our example response B, say my input direction, vector three SO. I'll pick one that I've created, I'll go with this forward, and I'll uh, take a look in the project, see what's in there. So this forward is a scriptable object that just contains a 001. All right, nice. So now I go here and uh, I click this, and I can see my 001 shows up there. So yeah, this scriptable object-based approach, I can use this any kind of static data I want to send. Just pack it, if it's if it's not supported, just pack it in a scriptable object. A bit of a nuisance, uh, but it works. And you, you get the you get to put a nice name on the values. Uh, so it's not just 001, but it's forward. Lastly, uh, on this, there's a few other tricks that you can use. Uh, these are more just convenient sort of things. Uh, so by a relay, what I'm saying here is if you have, say, five different things that each of which trigger the same five other things, well, that's 25 connections that you have to make. One way you can cut that down is to have uh, something like a relay component. And this is like one of the script, simplest scripts you'll ever see. It's a Unity event for an output, and it has an input, it just invokes the output. This is all it does. Like, okay, why, why is that useful? Well, you could just have each of the things that are a trigger connect to the relay, and then the relay connects to each of the things that responds, and, and that cuts. It. So now instead of having 25 connections, you have five to the relay, five going out, there's 10, and it doesn't go up, and it goes up linearly rather than exponentially. When should you use Unity events? Because uh, I've been uh, describing them as just a way to connect different scripts, makes different scripts talk to each other, but it's not the only way. I'll describe each of those now and I uh, go over when to use each. So the first is a, the simplest is the direct reference. And if you've done any programming at all, I almost guarantee that you've used this uh, quite a bit. So as an example, just uh, so it's clear what's I'm talking about, uh, let's say I have example trigger A, and this has a reference to script B, serialized or, or public, either one. And then on start, it gets that thing and has a dot. So whenever you see this dot, it's probably a direct reference going on. And then it calls that function right here. Okay. And then it just prints this, this console line out. So let's uh, verify that that works. Oh, yes. And um, for this to work, we need to make sure that this trigger has a reference to B. OK, great. So now in Watch My Console, as I start the game, there we have it. Direct reference as successful. OK, so that's the first one, is this direct reference. Next is the C sharp event. And how this works, this is a little bit more, more complicated, is instead of having a reference to B, I just create this thing, a uh, public action on start. And then I have this line on start dot invoke. And I have a question mark here in case, uh, just to avoid certain errors. And then, and notice that there's no reference to B, to script B anywhere in this. This is no longer dependent on B. However, B, has a couple of things. It has a reference to A. And by the way, if anyone tells you that event-driven programming removes coupling and uh, removes dependencies, that is a lie. It just reverses them because <laughs> uh, now B has to have a reference to A. Um, so this has a reference to B. And then in awake, we uh, subscribe to on start this method. This method gets added to the things that happen when on start is called. 
And then uh, just to make sure we don't build up a bunch of references to this on destroy, we'll uh, clean that up and remove it. Uh, and so this sets up the connections, then A calls this, this invoke. And since this is a listener, it, it prints out this line that has been subscribed. So we'll run this again. And then when we run this, we see that the event listener uh, is successful. Okay, nice. Okay, and then I've already mentioned how it showed how Unity events work. And then there's also another uh, way of getting things to communicate uh, with scriptable objects. There's a talk on Unite Austin 2017 game ar architecture with scriptable objects. Uh, there's a, a link here. I highly recommend uh, looking this up. Um, but essentially, yeah, this is just a different way to, to get things to communicate with each other. So, okay, we have those four ways to, to get things to communicate. And I'm not including things like singletons or um, dependency injection systems uh, on this list, because I essentially would think of those as a combination of multiple of these things. So like a singleton might have uh, the invoker, the trigger would have a direct reference to the singleton, and then the singleton might have a direct reference or maybe be connected by a C-sharp event um, to the responder. And so that's just two connections. Out of all of these, when do we use this one? Well, there's basically two questions that I ask in each case. Question one uh, is, does the direction of causality match the direction of dependency? And if you're not familiar with those terms, it's because I made them up. Direction of causality, is that's this is the straightforward one. It's when A happens, B happens. So whichever happened first, uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the cause. And the thing that happened next is the effect. Uh, and the direction of dependency is, does, is, a question, is um, whether A by its nature depends on B or whether it makes more sense for B to depend on A. Uh, so in, this, in the case of the code examples, the direct reference A has a, has a reference to B, so it, it, it needs to B in order to work. And, but B doesn't require A. Uh, however, the uh, C-sharp event, uh, B has a reference to A, so it requires A to work, uh, but, but B doesn't require A. Uh, so that's, that's what the direction of dependency is. And what matters here is, which way makes more sense given the scripts that you're working with. So in my uh, example here where I just have like a, you know, hello world type stuff, uh, it doesn't matter because it's totally arbitrary because the code doesn't actually do anything. Um, but it's, this is something that you think about like, oh, which should, which can exist without the other. And it's, and it's kind of a subjective question in a lot of ways. Uh, but the, the key thing to be thinking about in this question is how it relates to the causality. Is, is, the, is the ideal dependency the same as the causality? So A depends on B, or is it reversed that B should depend on A? Now, if you might be thinking, well, neither one depends on the other. Uh, say I have a lever and a door, and well, a lever could turn on a light switch or could open multiple doors or it could do nothing. Uh, a lever doesn't inherently depend on a door. And likewise, a door doesn't inherently depend on a lever. You could push it open. Uh, there could be a timer. There could be any number of things that open it. Uh, well, I would say there's still a dependency. It's just not a conceptual dependency. It's this lever happens to open that door. So this lever is dependent on that door. It's just not that levers as a concept are not dependent on doors as a concept or vice versa. And so that's that's my second question, is the, is the connection, because if there isn't a connection, then they're not related and it's just not, this isn't, none of this is relevant. Uh, if one thing causes something to change in something else, there is a connection. And the question is, is that connection between the concepts themselves intrinsically uh, to, what, to what those are, or is it just between specific instances? Uh, so as an example of an intrinsic connection, a realistic movement controller um, or one implementation of it could rely on a physics system. So that that's, in this case, movement depends on physics. But the switch uh, to a door, that is an instance connection. So once you have those two questions answered, then we can just go back to this little table right here and 
find the spot. So uh, A to B connection, so um, kind of a forward thing, and the concepts are connected. That's a direct reference. Concepts are connected, but it's reversed. Then that's a C sharp event. If it's instance to instance connection, neither concept depends on the other, then use a unity event. And then if it's instance to instance, but it's reversed, then you can use that scriptable objects approach, which I haven't really talked about. Uh, however, part of the reason I'm not mentioning them is because I find this quadrant to be extremely rare. And the reason for that is when you're going from one instance to another, then the, the direction of dependency is pretty arbitrary. It's, it's just, you're just setting it up once, it's, there's no long-term implications. So you could use either of these, it really doesn't matter. And Unity events are simpler and lower overhead, so just use those. Um, there is an exception to that. So like if you're using uh, objects that are spawned at runtime and you need those to connect to each other and you just can't connect them by Unity events, or you're working between, uh, between objects in different additive scenes, and so you just can't connect them, uh, then that would be a, a reason to use the scriptable object approach. And so if that applies to you, uh, go look up this talk. Uh, lastly, I wanna end on uh, when not to use Unity events, when it's just time to use a different tool. And there are a couple of occasions. One is when the, the object that you know, your object is referencing uh, is changing a lot. So you, you noticed in the Unity events, like the first step was to drag in the field uh, drag in the uh, object from the inspector uh, that it's going to be communicating with. Well, if you don't know that in advance, uh, then that's obviously not going to work. Uh, however, one nice thing about uh, Unity event-driven programming is that it's not something you have to like completely lean into, uh, like ECS, for example. Like once you go start writing in ECS, you kind of have to make everything that way. Uh, Unity events are not like that. You can use them for the things you want to use them for and then just not use them when you don't want to. Uh, and uh, second, the one caution with Unity events is that they use reflection uh, for, for those connections. And this is a, a pretty processor heavy uh, uh, operation. So they can't, if you use them a lot, they can potentially drain performance. Although honestly, I've never actually seen that be a bottleneck. So run the profiler before you make any uh, premature optimizations. And then, uh, Lastly, this is kind of the big one of when not to use Unity events is when you have really complicated uh, interconnected systems. Uh, we're kind of seeing a little bit of that with that Arc Teleport in VR. There was a lot of components there and a lot of connections, and it took some effort to be able to, to, to look through all of those and, and see how it all worked. Now, granted, maybe that's still better than what it would have been looked like to see all those connections in code. But that was that was that example was kind of pushing it. I'll be honest with that. Uh, an occasion where it really starts to get difficult is if you have something as complicated as a character controller, where you have like lots of different if you were like really break that down into building blocks and have them all connected by unity events, uh, that would get pretty unwieldy. Uh, however, one thing I'll note here is that that's no reason not to start building things. Uh, in this kind of uh, unity event driven approach and as, as little building blocks connecting to each other uh, because you're not painting yourself into a corner. You might not be able to connect things in that way ultimately, uh, but that work is not gonna be totally wasted because there is a level up to this uh, unity event driven system that I'm, I'm showing you uh, that deals with this problem of highly inter interconnected systems. Uh, and this is something I uh, call and I'll, I'll probably talk about this more in a future future lecture is something I call nested composition. You take your unity event script, delegate all the guts of it out into a plain C-sharp class. Uh, and then you can write higher level classes that tie those delegated things uh, together. Um, so actually, I think I'll, I'll see if I can bring up an example of this. Uh, so I had a, a mouse look kind of thing. And so this is something to just, as I move my mouse around, the, it causes the character to, to look around, to, to rotate its body, and then also turn the camera up and down. And you can see that this script now just has three lines in it. It has a process uh, and an update loop, and just basically just things to hook into the built-in Unity methods uh, because all the stuff of this is not going to be a mono behavior, so it needs to know when those are called. And then all the real work happens inside of this mouse look, uh, which has stores some references, some settings, 
And then it has all the component parts uh, delegated down further. So we have this get mouse movement, uh, just checks how the, the input get axis is working, has some multiplies by some sensitivity and uh, returns back that vector. And then it uses those to, uh, to apply a single axis rotation, which uh, just stores the current rotation and allows you to, to move it on that one axis without touching the others. And uses one of these to turn the body and another to turn the camera. And then this is that whole process. And now one downside with this approach is that you can get tons of fields uh, in the editor uh, that are really just tedious to set all of those. So uh, one way I can avoid that is to have just to use on validate and set the things that I uh, where I know what the values are just based on the nature of this component. If I'm using this mouse look, then I know I want one thing to be on the y axis, the other to be on the x, um, and you know a number of other fields about that. So, so that was a little bit of a, a rushed uh, explanation there. Uh, but the point of it is if you build things in this unity event driven way and you start to run into limitations, there is a way out and you're not, it's not going to get you stuck. Thanks for watching. Uh, I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions, please uh, leave them in the comments and I will see you in the next one.